Uh, this evening, we're really going to focus just on, well, one verse in particular, and that would be verse 12 of John 15, but I do want to read a little bit more of the context. So John uh, chapter 15, you know, it's funny, we went through the Gospel of John not that long ago, but it does seem like it's been a long time already. Uh, the Gospels, I, I think, of, of all the books of the Bible are, are the, the richest, uh, the most challenging, but also the most uh, encouraging. Uh, Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing now, this evening. Now, I've already reminded you, but I'll remind you again this morning, we were looking at how great God's love toward us is. That He loves us with infinite love because He is an infinite being. That He loved us or He loved a world, and we were certainly a part of that world that was in rebellion against Him, and yet He still chose to love it that in his love he gave what was most precious to him, uh, not just precious to him, but one who is in, of, in and of himself precious, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose value is greater than anything we can conceive. The infinite price the Father paid for the infinite sins that we had committed against him. And we saw that in his love he gave his Son that he might save us and give us an eternal inheritance. Now, we really should ask this question, why did God do this? Did he do it for himself? Did he do it for his own benefit? Did he need to save us? Did he need a people to worship him and to praise him? Well, the answer is no, God doesn't really need anything. He didn't need to do these things. He chose to do these things. He doesn't need our praise, although he certainly has every right to require of it, of us, since he has done these things for us, and he certainly receives us. But he did these things for our benefit, because we needed it. He did it because of his love for us. Now, what we saw this morning with regard to God's love and his giving is really only a part of all that he has given us and all that he has done for us out of his love. What I would like for us to consider this evening is, is this, that the other persons of the Godhead are equally involved in this loving and this giving. I want us to consider how Jesus loved us and how he gave to us, how he ministered to us. I want to consider how the Holy Spirit loves us and how he gives to us. And then finally, I want us to consider that this is also what our Lord calls us to do to love and to give, to be not just uh, receivers, as it were, but those who give, 
And I just want to remind us that you know, the, the end of the Christian life is, is not simply to worship the Lord and receive from Him. That's really the preparation, uh, the encouragement, the way we kind of get plugged into the power, get refreshed so that we might actually do what He has saved us to do, which is to reflect His image in doing what He would do. So first of all, let's consider Jesus' example, which is what he points us to in, in our text. He says in verse 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So we are to follow Jesus' example in loving as he loved us. Now, we should ask the question, how did Jesus love us? Well, we know that what Jesus did, everything that Jesus did, he did for a couple of reasons. Mainly, he did what he did for his father so that he might repair his honor because his, we sinned against him and that dishonored the Lord. To satisfy his justice, God wanted to, uh, to forgive. He wanted to save. He wanted to reconcile. And in order to do that, Jesus had to come and pay this price. Jesus did what he did to set things right but we also need to see that he had us in mind. We were on his heart. He came into the world and did what he did because he loves us. Now first, he loved us by giving up the blessings of heaven. And here we get into one of those areas that's a little bit difficult to understand because he did and yet he didn't. <laughs> he gave up the blessings of heaven with regard to his human nature at least for a time, but not with regard to his divine. Jesus, as it were, descended, not by giving up his divinity, but by joining himself to human nature. He came into this world. But remember how he came into the world. He didn't come in king's palaces. He didn't come to enjoy the pleasures of this world. But he came to live in poverty. He came to live in hardship in order that he might, out of his love, make us rich. That's what we read in our meditation. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now again, like, as I said before, he didn't become poor by giving up his divinity or his deity, or the blessings that he enjoys as God, we want to make sure that we avoid any idea that Jesus emptied himself of his, of his deity and just basically became only a man. He was no longer God. The Son of God was still in heaven. The Son of God still enjoyed everything that was in heaven, still the riches of heaven as it were. But yet in the human nature as he was in this world, he gave up all of those things, becoming a man like one of us becoming the son of a poor carpenter, remembering that his crib, you know, think about how, how uh, no, you know, nobility, uh, rich people treat, treat their children when they're born and so forth. They have this lavish nursery. They have this ornate crib. Jesus' crib was a cattle trough, and his first nursery was a stable. Jesus gave up all that glory and, that, and those, those riches, as it were, to endure this poverty. In becoming a man, Jesus also gave up the perfect fellowship that he enjoyed in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit to take on, as it were, almost a new kind of relationship, one of subordination as a man, one of being filled with the Spirit instead of, you know, that, that I, as he experiences as the Son of God, this equality with the Father and the Son. He does become subordinate, as it were, to them. Giving up that fellowship, he lives among a sinful people, who would at first follow him, but who would later reject him and would force uh, the hand of Pilate to crucify him. That's the kind of people Jesus came to live among. He willingly submitted to his father's law, really he submitted to his own law, and took the obligation to obey that law for us so that we might receive the blessings that he earned so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. The one who is the king and the Lord of all humbled himself and he became our servant. 
The creator becomes a creature that he might serve his creature so that through his constant service to us, we might be saved. Now, Jesus did work hard and he worked tirelessly and he ministered and he served. And even when he paused to rest, it was only that he might get away to refresh himself in the presence of the Lord and to seek him in prayer so that he might continue to give himself more to serving our needs. That's the example our Lord gives us. The one who is the Lord and the giver of life, who created life, subjected himself to death, as the table reminds us. He laid down his life for us, and he didn't do it for himself. He did it for us because he loved us. Jesus says in verses 13 and 14 of John chapter 15, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, he says, if you do what I command you. Jesus laid down his life, not for himself. He laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for us. And of course, our Lord Jesus did more than this. He not only died for us, but he was raised for our justification. He ascended to prepare a place for us in heaven. He was crowned with, with authority and power that he might rule over us and protect us from our enemies. He sits at the right hand of God that he might intercede for us, that he might pray, that he might plead his merits on our behalf. And he's coming again one day that he might receive us to himself. When we finally get to heaven, Jesus will be there. He will love us, he will care for us, and he will cherish us as a husband cherishes his bride. And then finally on the day of judgment, Jesus will declare us to be not guilty. He will acquit us of all guilt. He will purify and recreate the present heavens and the present earth into a new heavens and a new earth, and then he will welcome us into that kingdom where we'll spend the rest of time uh, with him. Now again, we should ask the question, did he do all of this because he needed to do all of this, because he needed it for himself? No, he did it because he loves the Father. He did it also because the Father promised to give him the reward, but the reward that he was after was us. He did it for us. He did it because he loves us. He did it because he wanted us. He did it because we needed this. And so out of his love, he provided it. He loved and he gave. The Father loved us and gave us a son. The son loved us and he came to save us. Now what's true of the Father and the Son is also true of the Holy Spirit. He was also sent into this world so that in love he might minister to us, that he might serve us. Now this shouldn't surprise us because we have been looking at this through our study on the Holy Spirit, the fact that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all share the very same nature. We can know the Father, Jesus says, by looking to the Son. He who has seen me has seen the Father. But we can also know the Spirit by looking at Jesus because they're basically all the same. And just as the Father gave and just as the Son gave, so the Spirit in love also gives. He also ministers. Now, how does the Spirit serve us? Well, first of all, He came from heaven, even as our Lord Jesus, that He might work within us the new birth, that He might raise us to spiritual life. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And there, of course, we know from the rest of Scripture what Jesus meant by that is unless one is raised to life by the Holy Spirit and given new eyes to see, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He also said in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It is the Spirit who gives the new birth. He is the one who works love in our hearts. 
that gives rise to faith. Remember, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, the kind of love that actually animates or gives life to faith. Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That's what the Spirit of God works within us, a faith that loves. He is the one who, in a certain sense, gives us spiritual eyes, who pulls back the veil, who shows us the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What does he mean by that? Well, unless the Spirit of God works to pull back the veil from our eyes because we're blind to the glory of God and shows us the glory of the kingdom of heaven in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless he does that, our hearts will not be drawn out in love. The love that we need to be able to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive him as our Lord and Savior. This is what the Spirit of God does out of love. He ministers this grace to us. He gives it to us so that we might trust Jesus and be saved. And once he's brought us to Jesus, his work isn't over. The Spirit of God is the one who teaches us the truth so that we don't fall into the snares of the enemy and we're not destroyed by his lies. Jesus said in John 16, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. And John writes in 1 John 2, 27, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it is taught you, you abide in him. The Spirit of God is our teacher and the one who guides us in the word of God. He's the one who illumines scripture. Not that he does anything to the you know, the, the letters written on the page, but he is the one who shows us the glory of our Lord Jesus, the glory of God. He's the one who shows us the beauty of God's ways in the word of God so that we will love what we read and loving what we read, we'll read it more and we'll study it more and we'll want to do what it says. That's the primary way the spirit of God works in us to teach us the truth and to lead us in the truth. <clears throat> the spirit of God also helps us to obey the Lord. He's the one who's working in our souls, moving us to follow God's commandments so that we will receive the Lord's blessing. And he's the one who brings us to repentance when we fall away from the path which the Lord calls us to walk on. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, For what the law could not do, that is the law written on stone, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. The Spirit of God is a living principle in our souls, working grace in us to give us the desire to walk in the ways of the Lord. And that for our good. And of course, he prays for us that the Father and the Son's will would be accomplished in each one of us so that we would be able to live as he calls us to live. Again, Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now again, why does the Spirit of God do all these things? Does he do it because he needs it? Well, he does it to seek the glory and honor of both the Father and the Son by doing these things in us. Jesus also benefits because the work the Spirit of God is doing, he is doing that he might save us, that he might preserve us, so that he might give us to the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, who's the main beneficiary in all this work and all this love and all this service of the Holy Spirit? 
We are the beneficiaries. The Father loved us and gave us a son. The Son loved us and gave himself for us. He continues, Jesus does, to pray for us from heaven. One day he's going to come again and receive us. And the Spirit loved us and brought us to life, teaches and guides us, gives us the power to obey, and prays for us to keep us from straying from our Lord Jesus. But what is, again, the goal behind all these things that they do for us out of their love and out of their giving? Well, they want us to become like them. We were predestined, remember, to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. They want us to mirror what it is that they are, want us to be a reflection of their character, to be living letters that are known and read by all men who would be able to see the love of God and, and the, the grace of God in our lives that we would be, like them, seeking the well-being of others. That's what the Father does, it's what the Spirit, or the Son does, it's what the Spirit does. Jesus said to his disciples before he sent them out to minister his gospel in the towns and villages in Israel, he says in Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you received, freely give. Now what he was going to have them to give was not Money was not alms to the poor because he basically told them to take virtually nothing with them and to receive their support from those they would go to minister to. So what was it they were supposed to be freely giving? Well, as those who had received freely of the Lord's love and of his mercy and of his grace and of his service to them, they were to be those who freely give. And obviously, the same thing is true for us as we have freely received of the Father's love, of the Son's love and ministry, of the Spirit's ministry. We are to be those who freely give. In other words, we have to be careful that we don't see our lives as something that we are to focus on to get the maximum pleasure out of this world. We are to seek, on, you know, seek after maximum pleasure, but we need to find it in the ways of the Lord, in the way that Jesus found it. Remember, Jesus basically, uh, one of the, I think it was um, in Isaiah, talks about what the Lord Jesus would be like. And he says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. You have opened my ear as a learner, as a disciple. You waken me day by day. His delight was to listen to his Father and to do his Father's will. That's what we need to be finding our delight in. That we, like the Lord Jesus, would love and serve others as Jesus loved and served us. That we would honor the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in this way. And of course, especially, that we might bring to others what they need most of all, which is the word of life the gospel, so that they might be saved. Now remember, we saw something of this in the Eighth Commandment. Remember, the Eighth Commandment says, you shall not steal, which means we're not supposed to take away from anyone what belongs to them without the owner's permission. If he gives us permission, of course, it's not stealing. If he doesn't give us permission, it is. But the other thing we saw in this commandment is we are not to withhold what the Lord has given to us to give to others in his name. Freely you have received, freely give. As the Lord puts before us particular needs, as we have the ability to meet those needs, we are to give of our time and talents to, to actually minister to those people and to try to help them, try to comfort them, try to do what it is that we can to minister to them, to serve them. Now this is what is to characterize our lives. This is what marks us out as Jesus followers. Not just that we you know, park our cars out here and worship on Sunday or that we tell others that we believe in Jesus, we love him and so forth, but that we live like him. The more we do this, the more we love, the more we serve, the more we honor the Lord and the more we honor him the more he says he will honor us. 
Now, Jesus said on one occasion, the one who humbles himself to become the servant of all is the one who will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Out of love, he humbled himself in order that he might serve. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus' love, as we've already seen, moved him that though he was rich, yet he became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. That's what Paul is talking about here. This is why the Father also made him the greatest in the kingdom. Now, Paul continues in verses 9 through 11, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus says the one who humbles himself to become the servant of all will be greatest in his kingdom. Jesus is the one who humbled himself most of all to become the servant of all, and because he did, he became the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He is the greatest, and he is the example that we are to follow. Again, Jesus tells us in our text, John 15, verses 12 and 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Every time we set aside our desires to meet the needs of others, we are doing what Jesus did. We are doing what Jesus calls us to do. Now, as we think back to the Reformation series, again, uh, there were so many good examples that we saw in those documentaries. But what is it that John Knox and John Bunyan and John Newton and Charles Spurgeon, and if we go back one year, George Mueller, and this year, Eric Little, what is it that they all had in common? Well, we know there's several things they had in common, not the least of which they loved the Lord and they were devoted to Him. But what did their love and devotion to Jesus look like? What did it move them to do? Well, to give themselves to Him by serving others. Think about all the people that benefited from, from the lives of these particular individuals. You know, think about how we've benefited from them. It wasn't maybe necessarily even through their teaching, although there are certainly things we can benefit from, from their teaching, but the documentaries weren't so much wrapped up in that as much as it was in their lives. Look at what they did. Look at the example they gave us. Consider the encouragements. That, I think, is perhaps the main way in which they have helped us. They were reflecting the image of our Lord Jesus and showing us how to live like that in today's world, particularly Eric Little. He's the one that kind of gets closest to us. Now, what is it that makes us love and appreciate other people? Isn't it basically those same qualities, those same characteristics in them? Their patience with us in particular, their encouragements of us or for us. They're coming alongside of us and helping us and supporting us. Isn't what we appreciate most in others the fact that they love us and that they show that love to us? Well, when they do that, they're doing the same thing that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have done for us. They're giving to us out of love because that's what love is remember love is not just the words and it's not just the concept and it's not just a warm feeling or a nice thought be warm and be filled but not doing anything love is actually uh, reaching out and ministering to the needs of those around us that's what these men did that's what the people we appreciate do that's what we appreciate about our Lord, isn't it? The fact that He loved us and ministered to us. And the Spirit, and of course the Father in, in giving to us His Son. 
Well, that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Jesus said in Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so as we remember today the love that the Father has shown us in giving us His Son, the love that the Son has shown us in giving Himself for us, and the love that the Spirit has shown in coming to us to raise us to life and to form Jesus in us, let's remember that Jesus calls us to follow their example and to reflect their character and their nature to be givers and not merely those who receive. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to uh, just take this on board and let, it, let the Spirit of God shape and mold our lives through that idea, through that concept, uh, to be like Jesus, to follow in His steps, to be those who give. Um, and let's also prepare to come to the table that we might receive grace to have more love so that we might be more inclined uh, to minister to others. Let's pray.